Hey, Creative Weirdos, it's Mai, the Cosmic Nomad, and today on the podcast, we have James Austin Hewitt. He runs his own gallery in Toronto, Canada called The Run Gallery, and is located at 514A Annette Street. And it's going to be an interesting, interesting interview. We talk about the art industry, all the crazy shit that happens, and, you know, being an artist in today's, you know, world with COVID and everything in between. So check out the episode. In the background is a painting by the artist uh, featured this month. Her name is Marina Fa, from originally from Brazil, mm-hmm. and uh, she has created somewhat of a story, a running narrative of her sort of experiences through her uh, diasporic reflection between Brazil, Europe, and North America. Mm-hmm. and her artistic achievements and endeavors throughout those travels and experiences. Uh, so the title is called The Ethereal Nostalgias of a Tropical Mutt, which is like, an, like a, a, a story title or a novel title. Yeah. So we have uh, not, an, not a running myth, but an upstaged myth because it's actually a reflection of her lived experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. The PM. No, no, no. Whatever. Like I said, plug, plug away. Firstly, I should have said, nice to see you, brother. (laughs) It's been a long time. It's been a long time. I think it was like sometime, not this year. I didn't see you this year. I saw you sometime last year, like 2020. I knew I came by uh, uh, with a couple, with a friend or something like that to your place one time. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Elixirs, was it? Was there a show going on? Uh, someone was either playing. I think you had a band there. Yeah, I think you had a band, oh, yeah. and it was it was, it was fall. It was around fall. It was around this time of year. You had a band. That was two, that was two years ago. Wow. Yeah. You're. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, we were doing a stress test on the block before we even opened. Mm-hmm. To see if we get a lot of noise on the weekend going late, so we had. Two bands and full drum set up just to see if the uh, the neighbors in the apartments upstairs would complain, and they actually came down and joined us. That's amazing. Also, and we had a pop up uh, DJ set by Kavesh, which was incredible. It's live PA thing. Sweet. Turned into a really interesting, fun night. The place got packed quick because it's small, but uh, it was still quite enjoyable. So, tell me about this project that. Uh, that you've uh, that you started here. It sounds interesting. I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah. No. I kind of this was an off and on thing for a couple of years actually. And but there's a precursor that a lot of people that uh, like for example, I met you through Isaac years ago, right? And uh, <clears throat> years years and years ago, uh, I had a magazine, a, a, a physical publication that did really well in a short amount of time. That is essentially what this really is. And the name yes. of the name of this is what it was supposed to be, but then I gave right. that magazine another name. It was called Product Magazine, yes. and um, so it's me coming back to what I love doing. And I meet a lot of people all the time as I'm traveling and throughout the city and growing up in Toronto, and you and as well. So mm-hmm. it's me talking to all the creative weirdos that I met along the way that mm-hmm. I always wanted people to get to know. You know, because you know Toronto, it's like there's certain it's huge, but there's there's like at least a couple of degrees separation between people. And, you know, you know that person. Yeah, I know that person. Yeah. okay. so it's it's always that. Right. Yeah. So I always wanted to put a spotlight on a lot of these amazing people in Canada because I have this love, love, hate thing as people on these episodes have seen. I have this love, hate thing for Toronto, even though uh, Toronto's my home and I grew up there. Um, It doesn't do justice to artists and a lot of artists have to leave and there's only a certain amount of artists that come from elsewhere later on in life and do well here so it's this weird grass is greener on the other side thing going on sometimes whereas the people that are here sometimes have to leave so that's why i'm talking to a lot of weirdos like you you know my personal experiences uh that i've recently been told that collectors in Canada that enjoy collecting Canadian artists have a better chance and a more economically feasible chance of finding those artists in the States and purchasing those works from 
either private or uh, mm -hmm. primary market uh, dealers in the states versus Canada. This is why or, we're talking. This yeah, is this at, is at a lesser rate, even with the exchange, just because of the accessibility, the ease of accessibility. So that's something extremely interesting. That's sort of a bit of a flip side as well. We've always known about musicians having to you know, get their feet wet elsewhere. Yeah. And even painters in general, Canadian painters in general, have always had to do well in Europe first, and then to own, only to be accepted back in Canada afterwards. It's, it's, it's fucked up. It's because it, I've also, because I've been in all these different industries. And another thing is fashion does the same thing. Well, what fashion week is there now? For the last couple of how many years or five years? Is... So it's, it's, it's the creative aspect of the financial connections between the artists and the private collectors and so on and so forth. So it's not good here. And if they are here, they're old, old people that are dying off and their kids don't give a fuck anymore. And they're not mm. in, into, you know, philanthropy, non weird shit. You know, they're not into that anymore. So mm. keeping this Canadian, mm. it's sad. So please, I want you to don't hold back. I want you to like, let go and, you know, talk about this current Canadian or the past Canadian um, art industry. Well, most of the Canadian artists that I know who have done well uh, have left to do well. <laughs> some, some capacity or another, they left uh, at least to go to what's closest to be the States. <clears throat> uh, and it could be from just getting a studio in New York and, you know, uh, relaunching your painting career, let's say, to going to either the Rhode Island School of the Arts or Princeton or Yale to do a master's. Wow. So there, there are channels. Unfortunately, they flow away from here. <laughs> yeah, I see it all the time. Now, I'm, I'm feel, not home. I'm not even there. Now, from, my, from my perspective and my position immediately, I feel like I'm going against the grain of that status quo. Yes, you just are. By sheer essence of uh, what the gallery stands for, our sort of overarching mandate and our um our track record let's say mm -hmm. uh although we were only 15 months old we've really we've definitely created a ripple and uh definitely shown some very underrepresented talents the acronym once again is r-u-n um radically underestimated narratives mm. and i feel like filling that uh sort of uh unspoken quota when it comes to that acronym, what that acronym really means. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I don't want to make it too convoluted with my response, but no, no, dude, don't. Like I said, it's just us basically shooting the shit. So, because there's, there's a fine line between, you know, outsider art and uh, sort of uh, new wave, mm -hmm. but the way it stands right now in the art world, unfortunately, all over the place is that uh, the art and the money have a much different and interrelated relationship than before. Mm -hmm. Although the money's always kept the art afloat and vice versa with people's intrigue and uh, investing in provenance. Uh, nowadays, if success is equated with financial success, and most of the critics are just sort of over the moon at the fact that there are these younger and younger artists who are superseding the gallery and going straight to auction, mm -hmm. selling for 500000 to $1 million uh, under the age of 40. They yeah. see it as something that's preposterous and unheard of, but it is becoming a more regular thing. And, you know, the auction house, like any other corporation that don't really think has time to stop and smell the roses and think about these things. I think they just uh, are, you know, financial opportunists and love the low hanging fruit. So this, there's no more feeding into it. I feel like it's the detriment of the percept, the world that the wider perception of the art world, they're feeding into uh not a fake it till you make it mentality, but a 15 minutes of fame mentality where you're investing in empty, empty futures. Yes. Although you can benefit now like a pump it or dump it scheme with some empty condos in China. 
for example. Or the crypto it's, market. So it's sad that there is a sense of humanity that's sort of leaking out of what was once a very like human based and higher than tangible objects, special platform in life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also become harder and harder to stop and smell the roses in this sort of situational climate that we have going on. It's from so many different angles that we can't even get start to get into it, but it has affected what people decide what they have time to consider important. So do you feel that the, how these young people are bypassing these middle people and going straight to the auctions, how's that currently affecting the industry? I would say that it's already a difficult thing to, to sell art in the first place. Mm -hmm. So firstly, there are less and less galleries, brick and mortar. Yeah. Uh, for various reasons, including that reason. Uh, there is a loss of a very important liaison and relationship and a loss of a nurturing and growing of a career versus uh, an, easy, an easy, fast reward, which in the long run is not really as rewarding as the <laughs> artist may think at the time. But, uh, but what do you think in the Canadian sense? Do you think Canada was already on the, because the way I, at least from my perspective, I felt that Canada was already on the decline, you know, before this new, this new wave of, you know, people bypassing these middlemen. Well, I haven't really talked to other gallerists lately about sales, but it seems like everyone's doing okay. And, you know, we were just at Art Toronto mm -hmm. and uh, it felt like a healthy climate. There were less faces less everything, but what was there was still strong. And there were some really solid sales, major sales, larger institutions are still buying from galleries and therefore really, uh, uh, connecting with our, uh, certain rising artist careers in that sense. And I think it's very interesting now with Canada as a particular, uh, talking point, I would say that the changing of the guard has been happening for a little while. And Canadian, Canadian art. Yeah. <laughs> I'll know that uh, there was a huge shift, not only in um, staffing, but also in uh, mentality. Yeah. Overall, sort of uh, approach, strategic approach to uh, ideas of representation and, and uh, diversity on their board uh, all the way up and all the way down mm. to their staff. Uh, so I think with that being said, uh, plus the pandemic and not as many galleries uh, think ad space and therefore causing a chain of chain reaction mm -hmm. of, uh, of shortages, they had to fizzle as a physical yeah. uh, company. And they were an incredible and very important publication in the country. And mm -hmm. they really did have their finger on the pulse and were always very progressive in their thinking and excellent writing. Uh, so uh, with that being said, there was also a change in the regard of the National Gallery of Canada. And right when that happened, end of the summer, our dear friend Tao Lewis mm. got the show an enormous, beautiful textile based installation uh, in one of the huge um, rotundas oh, wow. at the National Gallery. So I feel like that was almost a reflexive act or activation based on this changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. Very refreshing, extremely beautiful and bringing eyes to Ottawa. I think that things like that are very important because the National Gallery has beautiful collection and at the same time i got to see rembrandt and a huge tutorial on, on on various processes of printmaking it was wonderful so sweet that's uh that's sort of my exposure to canada so far plus um 
It's funny, Galarus, uh, that are not B I P O C. Which is, for uh, those that don't know, that's what it's. Black Indigenous People of Color is the acronym. The acronyms, yeah. <laughs> Uh, are the ones that are I've had mentorship under. So during a time of, let's call it financial panic, mm-hmm. I had to reach out to my mentors to find some advice on how to um, keep things sustainable. And the, the popular response was, well, brand yourself as a black gallerist. But it was always non B I P O C mentors. Yes. I kept riding this card, riding this wave, riding this card. And um, <laughs> I was not only surprised, because it seems like it's already a played out notion. And um, they yeah. were all they were all kinds of serious about it. So um, that to me was almost a letdown Mm -hmm. although and say how i can't really voice how i would what kind of advice i would give coming from their perspective yeah do as gurus in the art world see that as somewhat beneficial i did sell a lot more art uh, during you know summer 2020 Mm -hmm. just off of instagram than ever before so that was something different yeah and also a huge reflex of what was happening whether it's played out or not as a concept or whether you want to pull that card in order to gain benefits or gain more exposure <laughs> yeah. it is a real thing and yeah let's the- no let's get into that because there's like i said other episodes of similar things of people in different uh fields in film for one from the previous episode saying similar things it's mm. it's a card that is sadly the individual does not want to use yes they don't want to use because they don't want to be pigeonholed or put into this box that they're only this and this is the only way that they'll get you know what i mean but then yeah, there's yeah. also financial incentive at least on the funding side even i can attest to that like it's now when it comes to funding yeah there are some, um let's say indigenous artists that i know mm-hmm. that i'm involved with who would be against uh, taking government funding because they have a knee-jerk reaction to be adverse to anything the government has to offer yes. due to the systematic history of being let down. Makes sense. So I see it as almost painful that that, that uh, sort of non-anti-dialogue exists because is it at one? Is it in one way the government making somewhat of an attempt to atone by investing in the future of certain people, and is it in another way a way for certain people to really get themselves out of a, purge themselves from a worse situation? I think it's. I think it's the the second because uh, I think a lot of people want to stay in power, and yes. they're just they're just basically you know pandering. Mm-hmm. because then they're seen as the most woke at the current time so then they're not tossed out they're not like the pitchforks don't come they're not like get the fuck out of here they're like no i'm one of you so, so there's a new term there's a new term called art washing mm-hmm. I feel like that's sort of an example of art washing in disguise of i guess atonement or reciprocity mm-hmm. or just going with what's hot it's a bit of both yeah it's a bit of both because (laughs) um i don't like the term bipoc but people use it i don't give a shit about it but um the only only reason why i used it was because i want (laughs) to just nail the point yes no no no. i I, I totally get it (laughs) it's 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 this term that popped up and it seems like mostly quote-unquote non-bipoc people are the people that are pushing it the hardest Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and then when somebody tells you you're this and you're like the fuck are you talking about i've never heard of this before um (laughs) we've kind of want to take bypass being pigeonholed now all you're doing is putting us back into that little spot and i'm like the fuck are you doing you don't realize that you're not helping none of this is helping 
Exactly. But but as artists, we're not always financially good. So sometimes you're like, I gotta take that money for now and then say fuck you later on. Tell me some of Facts. your woes. Tell me some of your woes on the same on the same topic, but from the uh, fashion and textiles industry point of view in Canada. Mm. So okay, in Canada. <laughs> so I've, I've had experiences in the art world. From yeah. Different it's ge- geographically, but Canada is an interesting one to talk about because we, as Canadians, try not to talk about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing about Canada is, first of all, a lot of our manufacturing is shit. It's gone or destroyed or, you know, there's very, and there's, there's young people that are, that are starting things on small local levels to, you know, get textiles back up, but it's not to the scale that we could be doing well as a country in terms of producing things uh in terms of the artist it's no not that different from you know let's just say fine artists but at least in this case your product is more usable not to knock you know visual artists and things like that but your product is essentially a utilitarian thing it's it's a clothing it's either you know accessories or things that are functional you know yes So there is a need for that, but then it's also saturated because now there's like Asian market. Some people don't even have to make the clothes. They just send out the samples and then it comes to them, you know, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to, that's just regular retail, but when it comes to like on the level of fine art type of people, like good designers, yes, they're there. But the sad reality is the industry has died or have, has been eradicated or for example, um, the last major fashion week, aside from the typical one that I think it was uh, whoever the sponsors were, MasterCard, Mercedes-Benz, or whatever, the old fashion week uh, is non-existent. And then I was the art director of the first season of um, Toronto Men's Fashion Week. Yes. And the amount of people that came together for the love of this whole thing to put this thing together, you know what I mean? And then to the point where we got international people back in into looking at Toronto as a fashion hub because previously we were you know because we had a show called fashion television i keep going on with this in different episodes but this was toronto toronto was on the map yeah. globally yeah Jeannie becker was on yeah the map for sure. yeah she put every she put everybody like everyone was coming here a lot of these supermodels were from here etc you know so well, the, it's the result of um both the sort of like rejuvenation of fast fashion and the hype beast Flip, cult, flip culture. It's not called. really, because that doesn't, that doesn't, it's not here. It's not, in, well, sorry, I can't say it's not here. I'm in, I'm in the U.S., so technically I'm in the U.S., I'm not in Canada. But what I mean is it's not in Canada because the hype stuff does a lot better in terms of new creators in the U.S. Yep. and not in Canada. And if it's Canada, it's small little brands that your local friend does or whatever it is, or it's resales of like major brands, Nikes or Yeezys or whatever the hell it is. Whereas yeah. in all of the unique new shit is outside of Canada. And Canada is just like, just consuming it from the outside in, you know, from bringing it in. Uh, yeah. But as it comes to designers, like I said, there's no, there's, they're here, but the support is terrible. And if it's a brand that has money behind it, it's, they have their own boutiques. And if those don't last too long because you see it on Queen Street or all these other streets, like, you know, and if they go down like COVID, like what happened, sadly, COVID made a lot of brands collapse and store of fronts yeah. collapse. They went online or they mm-hmm. st- have an art studio, but they don't have a storefront. Or if they do, it's a showroom that is not open 24 hours and people come in, you know, to, like old school designers. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not that far from from visual artists and things like that or fine artists. Yeah. So then the photography industry gets affected by the movements of the fashion industry. Not really. No, no. no. Because photography is it's it's wide open you can Mm. be doing commercial things for advertisements you can be on like for example i don't think see we haven't talked for a long while i'm in currently i'm in film and my my regular job or regular position is a unit stills which is basically a photographer on set so all the advertisement you see all the posters all that stuff the visuals are usually someone like me shoots that you know what i mean on set and So there is still jobs for photographers. It's not as, you know, not as easy, especially on film where film is one of the industries that it's not, they don't post jobs. 
it's all word of mouth. And if I like you and you're not a piece of shit and you're good at your job, dude, I got you for how many shows or movies or whatever, right? And if you unionize, you are... You unionize, you're... Special proof. Yes, essentially. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, but I'm also on the other side of film where recently I wrote a feature film that was in development and funded by Telefilm and um, formerly Bell Canada or whatever whatever they are now. I think they're still Bell. But yeah. that is where I want to get on to because we applied as BIPOC or basically in their terms, racialized individuals, <laughs> preferably black racialized individuals. So when that came up to me and they were like, hey, we're going to do this. And in my mind, back in my mind, I was like, <laughs> but it's money and I know what I can do with, uh, you know, cause it's just, you have to bite, you have to like bite down for a little bit and you're like, ugh. but then it's like, we just plus talked about it. Opportunity, uh, uh, plus global recession due to pandemic causes a little bit of uh, financial panic. So mm-hmm. you say yes to a lot. I was good day. though, but no, it's not, it's not even that I was, I was okay. Cause I kind of was writing this just before the pandemic was going and I stopped working so I can work on this. And I was kind of, I already saved up. So I was during COVID, I was pretty good. And then this happens and then I'm like, oh shit, this is dope. But still yeah. coming back to this whole point of artists and BIPOC, it's, it's each their own. For me, it's, it's always has, it has a weird connotation. Nice to see opportun- more opportunities in the arts in general. Yes. I would have to say, especially with the conservative municipal government. So, <laughs> yes, uh, you get you get you take what you can get because again, yeah. it's the next to impossible industry to really be sustainable or extremely successful in, mm-hmm. and it's uh, almost entirely driven by passion. So, oh fuck uh, yeah, you're used to there not being an economic reward at the end of the rainbow all the time, but <laughs> same time you have to live and eat. <laughs> yes, especially in a in a city. Yeah, you can you can attest to this because you you own retail space. So it's how expensive the city is getting and has gotten. You know what I mean? Please, please expand on that because yeah, housing especially. Uh, every single time a house goes on the market, you'll get about a hundred people going after the same house. And it'll sell for 500 over asking easily, which is just <laughs> preposterous in the first place, considering these small duplexes are going from mil two, mil five. <laughs> so if you think about a $2 million duplex with brooches mm-hmm. uh, that you'd have to fix up and throw another half a mil, 700 grand into to, in order to either flip or make completely livable and therefore rentable, outable. Yeah. Uh, your first step is battling 100 people and trying to pay for 500 over asking. So that's that's buying a house. So you know, 80 per, what is it? 80 percent of millenniums will not be purchasing homes. No, 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 no. Six, and um, so rent. The the one reason, knock on the wood, why I have this place is because rent was at the point where I couldn't refuse it as a commercial commercial boutique space mm-hmm. I refuse it because of how bad it is yeah so of course i took the crazy leap of faith in following through with it but it, it, initially it was because in reflection of how bad the rent is it was quite good yeah so it's, yeah close to home yeah no so because i remember uh before you opened up the gallery and i was like how's that process where did you like where did you, that idea come from to say, I'm going to open a gallery? Like, that's what I want to do. Because well, I, yeah. I knew you were painting and, and drawing and everything before. The idea was in a box. And I'd done a lot of uh, curatorial assisting, exhibition assistance. Mm. Felt like I had a knack for it and a knack for uh, installs as well. Because I'd done a lot of that behind the scenes at different galleries. Uh, so I was able to kill a few birds with one stone. And... Um, uh, I would. I had always been interested in the idea of showing other artists different venues, feeling mm-hmm. that certain 
others definitely belonged in different galleries and then finding a space for myself allowed me to just showcase those artists myself yeah and that was a uh, sort of a manifest destiny kind of thing oh, that's pretty good yeah i love your space it's pretty it's like intimate it's nice and you have a nice window like very nice outside i love the street too yeah i love the window i, I love that window yeah i don't want to move the computer right now just because <laughs> <laughs> and I know how <laughs> no because what it is is like what you're seeing is not what the end result will be like as of me I have another yeah. camera like right here that is like a, a pro camera so it's so I'm like split into the same way we're split side to side but mine is going to be replaced with the, this other one so right. yeah it's it's it's, it's pretty because my whole life is in is literally in a carry-on and uh, a camera bag that fits I mean, all my gear. Nice. Yeah. Will this be archived? Or will I be able to access it somehow? YouTube, Spotify, Google, uh, Apple, you name it. It's Is all there. It's and Instagram. The one? Is it Acetone or is it Creative Weirdos? So the overall brand is Acetone. And then the, podca the podcast is Creative Weirdos. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll start following today. Yeah, you can't un you can't unsee the logo. Once you see the logo and the little uh, thumbnail, it's like I know what that is. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm I'm sorry to say this, but mm -hmm. I do have to let you go only because I've got to uh, put on the final finishing touches. No, man. Our, you're a uh, you're a busy dude, man. And um, we will definitely keep in touch. Thank oh, yeah. you very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you, man. The third or f maybe fourth of Zoom cast that I've, <laughs> that I've been a part of successfully. Um, <laughs> right when the right when the pandemic hit and everything closed down. Yeah. I did a talk, I did a talk for U of T. Did a talk for Artscape as well. Nice. And, um, and did a talk for York University. The, oh, that's the, the you know, class. So that was a lot of fun and. <laughs> Um, no, we'll do this I when I come right. back, when I come back to Toronto, we'll do this in person at the studio. We'll sit that's down. That's exactly it. Open that's, tea or coffee. Yeah. Sounds good. Perfect. All right, okay, James. Thank you again. Um, big up to Acetone, Overarching, big up to the sub-label Creative Nomad. Yeah. Creative Nomads. Creative Nomads. Creative Nomads. And I called <laughs> it Creative Weirdos earlier. I apologize. We're all, it's all good. We're all weirdos anyway. We're all creative weirdos. All right. all right. One love, brother. Great to see you. Hi, brother. Peace. All the best. You too, brother. Peace. Hey, weirdos. It's my The Cosmic Nomad, and we've just dropped the dope black Nomad shirt, actually. It's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got one hand on the mic and everything like that, but, you know, it's pretty nice. And the print quality is amazing. It's another hand-drawn weird beautifulness, but with a retro vibe. And you can check it out. It's like, yeah, you can see that. Let me give me one second. Yeah, goes up to goes up to like three X. Whoever wants three X, all the way down to small. And we have um, dark heather, white, gray, and black. And in the hoodies, we have the similar. We also have the new Africa, you know, the Pan-Africa sweater and uh, Pan-Africa shirt and hat, though. So check that out. So don't forget to like and subscribe on the video and share the podcast as well as the videos. And if you see us on Instagram, like and share. Till next time, I'm Mai the Cosmic Nomad. Peace.